Okay, folks, today we are going to teach a neural network how to write a chalk talk introduction. Folks, I've been doing this for well over a decade, so teaching a machine how to do it shouldn't be that bad, right? Okay, first step, the input layer. Let's see, that's about 1,500 EE-related jokes. Some funny, some not so funny. Can't forget that one about industrial ethernet. That one was really not funny. We need a wide range of inputs, you guys. And then next are the weights. And then the hidden layers. Lots of math there. And then the outputs. And our outputs... Well, this one might not be so foolproof. Maybe this isn't as easy as it seems. Maybe we need some reinforcements. And maybe chalk talk chalkboard introductions aren't ready for neural network prime time. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Yes, we are talking about one of my all-time favorite electronic engineering subjects today. Machine learning. Anthony Huerica from NXP joins us to help us understand the what, where, and how of machine learning. Anthony and I discuss how neural networks work, what stuff can affect our model accuracy within our neural networks, and how the NXP EIQ machine learning software development environment can help us get on our way to neural network fabulousness. And we'll leave that chalkboard introduction training for another day. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about the NXP EIQ machine learning software development environment. Welcome, Anthony. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Okay, so machine learning is one of my favorite topics in all of EE, but I don't think we've actually talked on Chalk Talk about it very much. So give my audience a brief rundown on what exactly it's all about. So there's a lot of concepts in artificial intelligence and machine learning that often are treated as synonyms, but they're actually a little bit different. And so I want to talk a little bit about you know, what artificial intelligence is, what machine learning is, and what deep learning is. Great, okay. So artificial intelligence is the very broad concept of using machine to do smart things and act intelligently like a human. Sure. There are many ways that it could do this with machine learning or if else trees or several other different ways. But it's just this very broad concept. Machine learning, then, is a subset of artificial intelligence. It's the concept that if you give machines a lot of data, then they can learn how to do smart things on their own without having to be explicitly programmed to do that. If you think about how you would have a machine recognize a picture of a cat, it's very hard to create a specific program to be able to capture that with any cat. But if you give it lots of pictures of cats, the idea is that you can teach it how to do this. Right. Then deep learning is a further subset of machine learning. It uses neural networks to then automatically determine the most relevant data aspects to analyze. It uses different layers that then feed onto other layers until you get an output that will tell you what the picture is of or what the speech is of or any sort of other artificial intelligence application like that. Okay, Anthony. So where is this best suited for in the embedded world? So there's several different applications that you can see this being used. One would be image and object recognition. So if you think of like on a factory conveyor belt line, you could see what objects are being processed through the conveyor belt. If you have several different types, you could keep count. You could use it for like scales or any sort of image processing where you want to know what you're weighing or what you're looking at. Then you can use the image recognition for that. Same with voice recognition, with using your voice to command appliances. Anomaly detection, so you can determine, give it data, and it can know when a factory might fail or when something or a product might fail before it actually fails. Yeah. Smart wearables that can adjust to your specific body of what is normal for you uh, versus, you know, someone else, as well as other types of medical devices and then augmented reality of uh, displaying things in real time, but with a augmented virtual part of it as well in the, in the video. Sure. Now, I know that models are integral to neural networks, but there are some misconceptions about what they actually are. A model is a mathematical representation of a real-world process. Essentially, it's an extremely complicated math function that gives a smart output for a given input. Okay. So for a neural network, it's made up of many nodes, which are called neurons. 
that are then organized into multiple layers. Each layer could have a specific type of neural network mathematical operation, like convolution or max pooling, etc. And then each node has its own weights and biases that are used when calculating that particular math operation. So for a you know, example here, we have a picture. The input layer would have one node per pixel. Okay. So if you have a 32 by 32 picture with three colors, then you'd have 3,072 input nodes. Then those nodes have a specific value based on the pixel value, and then some mathematical operations are made, and that gets you to the second layer. And then from there, there's some more weights and biases that get you to the next layer. And then following at the end, you have an output layer, and you have different categories. So in this case, we have four categories. And the category that has the highest value is what the neural network thinks this image is. So you see in this case, the highest value is of a cat. And so therefore, the neural network thinks it's a cat based on that initial input value. So the idea is that you have all these weights and biases. And so that brings us into the next slide of how do we determine those particular weights and biases? Right. How does this process actually work? So there's two phases in the machine learning process. The training phase is where you're going to go do many, many, many thousands to tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands to millions of iterations, depending on the particular model and how accurate you want it to be, where you give it input data that goes through the mathematical calculation, it gets a value, and you determine, is this answer correct or not? If it is, then you can adjust the biases and go with the next photo. If it's not, then you could try adjusting the biases until you get a more accurate answer. You go through this iterative process trying to find the best value for the most number of photos. Once you have then a model that you think is as accurate as you're going to get it based on the training data, then you go to the inference phase. And that's where you give it new unseen data and then run the inference on it and it'll give you a prediction. And hopefully that prediction is is accurate. And that's how you can determine then the accuracy of that model based on this non-training data, this new data that you're giving it. Right. And Anthony, accuracy is super important with these models in particular, right? That's true. There are several things that can affect model accuracy. Some of that is the quality of the input training data, making sure that the data that you're feeding it is what you would be then using in real life and isn't blurry. The quantity of the input training data, so the more data you give a model, the more iterations it can do, the more accurate that it'll likely be. The particular model structure and training method, of course, makes a big difference. The efficiency of the model conversions that we're going to be talking about a little bit later, taking these models and putting them on an embedded system. And so there's a conversion process to kind of squeeze down the size of those models. So making sure the quantization and pruning that you're doing doesn't hurt the model accuracy too much. And then, of course, the quality of the input test data. If you have a camera and it's out of focus or not very good compared to what your input data is, you're not going to get very good results. You also want to be careful on training data. There's a really interesting story. They were training a model on how to recognize cancerous cells. And what they didn't realize at the time is that all the pictures that had cancer were at a higher contrast level than the ones that didn't have cancer. And so they're training the model and they get these really great results. But the model was just training itself to recognize that, oh, this picture's brighter. It must right. have cancer. And then when they actually showed it like uh, new input data, it failed miserably because they were all taken with the same brightness level. So those are the kind of things you have to be careful about whenever you're training the data. Now, having a good platform for any neural network is crucial. And you guys have something in this arena, right? That's correct. So we have something called EIQ that we're developing. It's a software development environment. It's basically an inference engines to run models of all types on NXP's embedded systems, both microcontrollers and application processors. So we have several different inference engines uh, available today that make use then of the uh, ARM compute library that then can run on a Cortex-M and Cortex-A cores. We have a lot of features planned for the future, uh, including running these models to make use of the GPU, DSPs, and even hardware ML accelerators, as well as adding application examples like facial recognition, object detection, voice recognition, etc. So we have a lot of things planned, and this is the features that we have today. Cool. So what kind of inference engines are available? For our Dynamo XRT family, we have two that are available today and one that we're actively developing on. The idea being that you have a pre-trained model. There's many pre-trained models online that you can download and play with, or maybe you already have one that you've already created. And then you would convert that into a format that then could be used on an embedded system. So on the item XRT, you'd run the EIQ uh, inference engines that we have these different types. The input could come from like a camera or a microphone that's on the board or some other sensors. And then that would create a prediction that you could then use for your embedded application. So we have several different types of inference engines available, like TensorFlow Lite, SimpsonN, and Glow. 
So to give more details on the TensorFlow Lite inference engine, uh, this is actually developed by Google. It uses a utility called TF Lite Convert. That's just a script to convert a TensorFlow model into a TF Lite binary. And then basically you import that TF Lite binary into an embedded system project. And then we have the TensorFlow Lite inference engine that's running on an iDynamics RT, and that's going to run your TensorFlow model then. And the important thing to note here is this is you know, specifically for use with TensorFlow models. Sure. The next one is the Simpsons NN inference engine. So this one's developed by ARM. And it's an API to implement common model layers, such as convolution, fully connected, pooling, activation, et cetera, very efficiently. The idea being that you would translate your model to be able to run using these simplified API calls. So there's some conversion scripts that are available from ARM that do this for you for cafe models. And you could also use Simpsons NN to optimize the implementation of other inference engines. It's basically just a, a API to call these common model functions. Okay. And Glow was the last one on the list, right, Anthony? That's not gorgeous ladies of wrestling. That is not. Uh, I do love the TV show, but it's actually an inference engine developed by Facebook. So this is kind of unique in that it's a compiler that turns a model into machine executable code for the target device. So basically, it's combining the model and the inference engine all into one. And because it's a compiler, uh, you can do a lot of really great optimizations for the particular ARM core that you're running on. And then you would integrate this merged model plus inference engine into your project. So this is some really cool cutting edge technology, something we're still working on, so we don't have it out right yet. But we want to talk about it because we think it's really interesting. It can greatly increase the inference times. Right now it's being used with PyTorch framework, but it could definitely be expanded to other frameworks in the future. Okay, Anthony, let's talk about the processor connection here. Sure. So all these uh, inference engines I just talked about run in our i.mx RT family. It's a family of crossover processors from NXP. They contain ARM Cortex-M cores running at several hundred megahertz. There's a lot of integration of different embedded modules, deterministic instructions, and short latency. So it's kind of this perfect crossover of both an applications processor and a microcontroller. Okay. So one example of that is the uh, RT-1050 and 1060 family. So that's what we're running right now with the EIQ. So this is a Cortex M7 running up to 600 megahertz, which is 50% faster than other existing M7 products. Comes with up to one megabyte of SRAM. It has a lot of rich peripherals like motor control, flex PWM, quad timers, USB, CAN, Ethernet, SPI, Squared C. So basically, it can take your embedded smart AI application and then you can use that to control all sorts of other embedded devices and work with very feature-rich for embedded development. Nice. So, Anthony, do you have any examples you can show me? Sure. So, the EIQ software package comes with three different categories of examples. We have uh, CIFAR 10, which is, does simple image classification, keyword spotting, which takes uh, audio and can tell you what words, uh, there's a handful of keywords that will recognize. And then we have a label image where you can do more advanced image classification. We have some labs online on our website where it'll teach you how to retrain that model to recognize your own images. So that way you can do some image recognition with that. And then I also have a demo here using the keyword spotting where it's running some Sysin in and it uses the onboard microphone to then identify some keywords like up and down using that neural network. Okay, so let's see that demo in action. Up, down, right. Off. On. All right. Well, Anthony, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. You're welcome. It was my pleasure. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about the NXP EIQ machine learning software development environment. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. Can't miss it, it's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, keyword EE Journal.